Hello, Acron fans! This is Shadow Fury 3 bringing you a, another Acron stream match, another live match. This time, I, gonna be honest, I forgot to check the replay names before, or replay players before I started, so I'm just gonna dive right in. And then I will get going. So, we're gonna have the first replay on Overgrown Citadel. This is a very small map, the smallest map currently available on Acron other than Iced, which, as far as I know, is not available. And. This is going to be an interesting match, probably a more rush-oriented match, but despite its size, Overgrown Citadel tends not to be super rush-oriented. So, let's just figure out, we are looking at Sunstrider versus Rar the Flying Toaster. So, let's begin. See that Sunstrider is currently in the right side of the map. Sorry, Flying Toaster is in the right side of the map, Sunstrider is in the left side of the map. Flying Toaster is Grekum, Sunstrider has not chosen his race as far as Flying Toaster's point of view sees. Sunstrider, however, has in fact chosen CISO, so we see this is a CISO versus Grekin match. So, Sunstrider going for, rather quick, more economic build, 4LC, 1QP. He is not going for the faster importer, actually 5LC, 1QP, not the fast importer, so more of a safe economic build, not a rush build. Rather the Flying Toaster, on the other hand, we see from his point of view, he is about 15 seconds into the game. He is getting standard build, getting his Faro up, we don't know what he's going for quite yet. He is trying to make sure his tanking is correct, but he is... Double, just keeps rechecking his past. Looks like he's got everything pretty solid, so continuing towards the future, getting his Faro to regenerate, and we'll be building some Octos quite rapidly, none of which are being directly used for resources right now. So it's hard to tell if he's going to go for a quick rush or just resources, but probably resources. He probably just didn't use the resource processor function from the pro triad. And yes, he is building one resource processor, but strangely not building... Oh, no, there he is. Okay, now he's building his resource processors, just not building them straight off the progeneration. Grekum can build resource processors straight off progeneration, so this is rather unusual. Anyhow, both players are actually going for roughly the same build. 5LC, 1QP. But Sunstrider is getting a bit of an advantage. He has his importer up as well, so Sunstrider will start getting reserves. Both players are actually focused on the present right now. And here we have an Octo, another Octo, so 6LC. And 1QP for Roar the Flying Toaster. Sunstrider, on the other hand, also going for 6LC and 1QP, but his RP is not open yet. It looks like his RP is actually finished when he is. Sunstrider is still going for basically the same strategy. Factory, like I said, sort of economic. He has one reserve, he has a factory up, likely to get an ATHC very quickly, and getting a Marine down into the southwest corner of the map is expansion to build even more resource processors. While an Octo is coming in from Rod the Flying Toaster to scout, hard to tell if this is an Echo Attack or not. Echo Attacks have become less common in recent times. Anyway, Echo Attacks have become a lot less common in recent times, and this is going to be hard to tell if this is going to be an Echo Attack. It looks like there's still more coming. So, no, there was more coming. Flying Toaster had managed to do much more damage from his point of view, but it is being undone, and it looks that he is... No, he is going to be undoing this attack, so this Octo attack was an Echo attack. Instead, going to the south corner of the map and using it to expand. So he doesn't know now what Sunstrider is up to, and it's going to be expanding instead of attacking. There's really no point in attacking the CISO base right now. The importer is really the big weak point, and I suppose also the RPs. The RPs are hard to hit, hit on this map, so there's not much point in going in there. Going to the expansion would be far more fruitful, but he doesn't know... That is, the Flying Toaster doesn't know Sunstrider has that expansion, from what I can tell. So, Sunstrider currently has a very safe expansion, and quite in the future too, at the 420, 4.30 mark, about a minute and a half up from the present, which is when S Flying Toaster is settled. He is quite well set up, and I he has a Macrofab, he has two importers, not getting any ATHCs, I'm really surprised he isn't going for as much harassment as I expected, he has a mech though, and his Macrofab not currently being used for anything right now. Mostly using his reserves for inventory rather than using it for any vehicles. Like I said, very interesting tactic right now. I don't think he is actually planning on doing that. I think he's being distracted by something. He is setting up a Marine to build some RPs. And he is setting up a fairly good infantry defense. He has machinery, so he will be able to build up whatever he needs from his Macrofab or his factory. He doesn't have any limits on that. Just continually jumping back, trying to... Looks like he's just trying to review what's going on, but nothing really has happened eventful, so I'm not sure... Ah, here we are. Another art importer is being built, so he will have a better setup in the future. But he wasn't really starving. Ah, here we are. Now we have an ATHC. So, he wasn't building up until the 
guess until the present got closer. I'm not sure why. I mean, he's not going for delayed attack in the looks of it, so I don't see why he was actually waiting as long as he was. Really, you want to be attacking. If you're going to be rushing, you want to rush as soon as possible. Unless you're going for a delayed attack, in which case you don't. And he does not see the Octopod. No, he does see the Octopod. Just barely sees the Octopod. The Octopod, of course, sees it first and is in a much better position, a much better unit. The ATHC has not cloaked, and Sunstrider will likely be cloaking that because, of course, he doesn't want the ATHC to die. And Octopods can't attack close, so he might as well. Two Reefs coming in for Rod Flying Toaster. One of them has researched advanced structure, so Flying Toaster will be able to get Aspire up. Flying Toaster, for reference, is about 30 seconds behind Sunstrider. He's at the 447 mark right now, which is also the mark of the present. And Aspire is being built up at the 5 minute mark. So, Pharopods, and it looks like he has... No, he isn't quite enough for Pharopods. He has enough for Cephipod, though, if he wanted to. Sunstrider is not going for air units right now. Sunstrider isn't going for a lot of units right now, given what he has. And Flying Toaster, going back once again, setting up... His Octopod is hanging out here, but it doesn't look like he's going to be... Staying, or is it going to be staying? This is rather strange. I'm not sure why his Octo is not moving. That being said, it's not really relevant. His Octo, oh, sorry, Octopod was up here, and the Reef is also being built. This is at the 408 mark. And it looks that the attack, the ATHC, is going to be useful. So I guess that Octopod was actually echoed out. It was not moved to the north base, which is rather silly. The Octopod wouldn't be able to take care of that ATHC, no problem. And Sunstrider has not cloaked that ATHC. He is getting Mars, and this is a dangerous thing to get, at least for Flying Toaster. And... Flying Toaster has also been spotted. His expansion has been spotted, so Sunstrider knows what is going on. He sees the expansion in the northeast and in the south, and of course the base. Well, he knows where the main base is, and Sunstrider is going to have to deal with. Well, Flying Toaster isn't really doing too much aggressive right now. This is rather strange. He has a spire set up. He doesn't have any far pods or safety pods coming out, despite the amount of money he has. I would be suspecting that he's going for gate tech, given the fact that he's floating as much as he is, but. It's hard to say. He, if he's going for Gate Tech, I would imagine he would have more QP RPs like, being built continuously, though he does have quite a few as it is. The ATC is coming in. We'll be seeing the Octopod. The ATC is cloaked, so finally, Sunstrider has cloaked that ATC. It will be far more effective, of course, as cloaked and won't be able to be counterattacked unless Faro or Arctic is nearby. And Sunstrider is double checking his attack. He does see the expansion coming in, and here we are. So, Flying Toaster has started to move forward and will be defending this. Well blocking off this area anyway, not really be able to defend. He doesn't have Faro to support that, so he won't be able to detect what's going on. But he does have a defense force laid out just in case another force comes in from Flying Toaster and it looks like, sorry, from Sunstrider, and it looks like Flying Toaster has a Sepipod. He has a Sepipod up and will be able to see the ATHC stop it completely, so that attack has been completely countered. And this is why the forces were moving in, because now the ATHC has not dealt any damage. This is at the 621 mark. And Sunstrider has jumped back. We're about a minute behind the presence. And Sunstrider, a minute down here at the 550 mark, is moving away his ATHC. Does not want to encounter that battle, so undoing the battle entirely. The ATHC will be falling back for support. It has gotten the information it needs. A Sepi Pod is being built, so air units won't be as effective. However, Sunstrider... No, Sunstrider is very focused on getting Sepi Pods. He is not getting any oct or not getting any Faro Pods right now. And the Sepi Pod will be... Actually, it looks like Sunstrider is just jumping forward to double check what happens before that time wave changes things. The blue time wave, that is. And Flying Toaster, from his point of view, at the 522 mark, about two and a half minutes behind the present, is setting up the Sepi Pods. The Sepi Pods we saw before the ATHC, of course, has not been moved back yet, but it will be after the attack comes in. After the defense, I should say, from the Sepi Pods. So, Flying Toaster is doing a decent job setting up his defenses, and the ATHC has a superior seeing the ATHC run away as it has. So the blue time wave we see not much damage is being dealt. The only damage being dealt is the special ops on this RP right down here. And it's hard to tell even if that is the damage being dealt. Actually, we'd be able to see it from Sunstrider's point of view. Yes, that is the damage being dealt, so this sorry, Marine is attacking the RP. The RP won't be going down very quickly because I'm sure Flying Toaster has become well aware of this and will be destroying it quickly. But in the meantime, Sunstrider is just going nuts with this production. He does well, not only nuts, he doesn't have a whole lot of production. He could easily get at least two or three more factories in another macrofab. I'm surprised he hasn't yet, but he does have what he has right now, and he's getting a lot of Mar tanks. Really, he does need to have more of it, and the Semipods, here we are. So, Flying Toaster has changed around his strategy. So let's try to jump back to the 613 mark. Actually, now the 617 mark. He has jumped back, trying to counter this, and just moving away his Marine, so Marine will not be dying to Semipods. 
and the Flying Toaster has successfully defended his South Expansion and attacking him with Heavy Pots, Heavy Pots, no, Fire Pots, sorry, Fire Pot is coming in, has bypassed one of the, well, has managed to get through the Special Ops without dying at any rate, Special Ops and Mechs without dying, and Sunstrider fully aware of this, sees what's going on, but isn't attacking it directly, I'm especially not sending the Special Ops and Mechs back, he is going to be going back for 30 seconds, and yes, here we are, the Special Ops and Mechs are going to be coming towards that Fire Pot to attack it, and Rod the Flying Toaster is not going to be made aware of this until that red time wave down here comes along. And no, Sunstrider is going to babysit the battle. So that Fire Pod will be going down. The RPs are still heavily damaged, but not dead, which is the important thing. Flying Toaster, however, has decided to go back further with the Fire Pod. Still coming in, not dealing as much damage as he would like, I'm sure. Really? I'm surprised he isn't going to queue this... Ah, here we are. That's what I was to say. I'm surprised he isn't going to queue the attack around. No, he's actually going to be attacking this Marine directly and defend this... RP completely, the Marine is going to be destroyed, and Sunstrider has not gone to deal with it. Sunstrider, instead in the future, or not in the future quite, but he is closer to the present. At the 952 mark, he is going to be setting up his forces to go for an attack. Four Martanks, and HHC, six mechs, definitely useful to getting us Grekum, and they have a lot of air, you use Arians a lot, and an MFB to heal it all up. The attack is going out, and we have the attack going out of the South Expansion, but it is regrouping. It is not going to be attacking quite as directly. Probably will want to avoid attacking as spread out as he is. Will want to regroup a bit before attacking. And jumping back to the double check what's going on. And yes, there are semi plots and far plots coming in from Flying Toaster. Flying Toaster has jumped around and gotten more semi plots coming into the past. And far as well, Flying Toaster is going for a very powerful attack. The mechs are doing a great job stopping this, but they aren't going to be able to hit that far pod. The All the tensions have been destroyed. Really what he needs to do, what Sunstrider needs to do right now, and I'm not sure if he's going to do it, is to either get his rush going as quickly as he can, which... No, it looks like the rush has been destroyed, the Martangs were completely destroyed. No, he needs to get his defense source, is probably his best bet right now. Farapods that are unclosed forever are being destroyed in a hurry, so the mechs are doing a great job defending us the Farapods, and the Mars is doing a great job defending us the Octopods, so... This, this attack is being completely deflected, and Flying Toaster will not be able to do anything with this attack. We see the attack is still going on, however, Flying Toaster has not decided to change up his tactics at all. Or at least hasn't decided to change up his tactics in terms of numbers, but in terms of timing, he did seem to get his far pods in together at the same time, so Flying Toaster is going to be just retreating. He won't be able to deal any meaningful damage to the attack, but he does want to keep his units alive. They are expensive, he does not want to lose them. So undoing that attack, and now getting advanced weaponry. He does have legal class as well, but he doesn't have any pod class units progenerating, which means he won't be able to get any legal class units in practice. Sunstrider, on the other hand, is continuing to build up his forces. He is getting, he has gate tech, he has two teleporters. His attack force was decimated in that attack, however, so he doesn't have as many Mar tanks as he would like. However, this green time wave will probably bring along a change to that. We just double check what's going on here. Yes, the green time wave is where his attacks actually were, def or the attacks of Sunstrider were def were, sorry, attacks of Flying Toaster were deflected. Sunstrider will be able to defend on the green time if he has his forces and he is going to be attacking two teleporters and a slingshot will be able to bring, sorry, a teleporter and a slingshot will be able to bring this attack into the Grecum base as quickly as possible. And at the same time, Flying Toaster is setting up a lot of objects to expand. A Marine is trying to deal with this and yes, a plasma cruise missile has been fired by Flying Toaster. Will be coming in fairly shortly, but of course, the Chrono Fort arrival is somewhat random. So, Flying Toaster is using the options they sent to expand to attack the RPs of Sunstrider. So, doing a very good job getting in his... Doing an extremely good job, actually, getting everything working here for him. And, of course, he does have Gate Tech, which means he will be able to Chrono Fort back as soon as he needs to. And that is also true for Sunstrider. Sunstrider does have Gate Tech. It looks like there was a Chrono Fort departure. There was indeed a Chrono Fort departure. And here we have the Plasma Cruise Missile coming in, and it is going to be attacking directly completely missing. The forces were moved out of the way. Sunstrider did a great job avoiding it. No, a second force is going to hit the RPs, but those RPs were used, were on crates that were used up. Still a shame that he lost the RPs, and it looks like he is going to try to get them out of the way as quickly as possible, but the Plasma Cruise Missile is coming in, and will be able to destroy fewer of them. Will be able to destroy half the ones that are destroyed in the first place, but another Plasma Cruise Missile is being sent out. Flying Toaster is just going mad with these Plasma Cruise Missiles. And I can't really blame him. They're very powerful weapons, but at the same time, we see that at the 1129 mark, there's an attack coming in from Sunstrider in the north base. He is taking over the north base, and that will not be deflected easily. That being said, a lot of Chrono Ports are going on, and it looks like Sunstrider, his Chrono Port departure has not arrived yet. Ah, here we are. Now the arrivals are coming in, and 
at least from flying Tosa's point of view. And I'm not going to double check where the Chronoport arrived units are, because Sunstrider obviously does not see where they are on this timeline. He does see his own unit Chronoports, but these are all from the Plasma Cruise Missiles. They were not, from what I can tell, used on the... Let's see, is there a spike? There's a spike of blue. I'm going to check that spike of blue. Okay, that spike of blue is probably where the Plasma Cruise Missile actually came in and dealt meaningful damage. And that was the RP. So this force up here will not be heavily damaged as much as it may have been otherwise. So it looks that Sunstrider will be able to get away with this attack, but... Let's see, let's review. So, running back in the little instant replay of the attack, a Chronobomb was sent off. Okay, so that's what went on. Wonderful. A Chronobomb occurred, and now these units have been Chronobombed, but that gave Flantos quite a bit of time to prepare. Has he used it well? That's the question. That is the big question on my mind, and it looks like he may have not, but we are looking at the wrong point in time, Flantos's point in time. We see that he does have his far set up prepared. He is an Octopus. He does have far just in case any clovers come up. Not as useful as he would like, though. And unfortunately, the mechs are dealing a lot of damage. Once more, this Farpod is cloaked. That will be able to deal with things, but the uncloaked Farpod was killed very quickly. The mechs are being destroyed, and it looks like the attack has been completely deflected. So the Chrono Bomb, very effective, allowing, or possibly very effective, allowing Flying Toaster to prepare. At the very least, it did buy him some time, which is always useful. And Sun Strider, on the other hand, is going back. He still doesn't have any Chrono of his own. And yes, now he's seeing his units arrive. He does see the cloaked. Yes, now he sees the cloaked fire pods. A Spec Ops is going to be able to deal with this, and now Flying Toaster will be retreating. This is the 1330 mark. This is about two minutes after this attack first started, and it will be successful ultimately. We're very close to the playable past. And now Flying Toaster is coming back. Another Chrono Bomb, but it won't be doing anything because those units are in re Port Delay. You cannot Chrono Bomb units in re Port Delay anymore. That was an exploit. It allowed them to all die, but that has been fixed. So unfortunately, that Chrono Bomb was poorly timed. What he would have probably wanted was... Getting that Chrono Bomb right as we Chrono Port Delay finished. Unfortunately, not as effective as you would like. So, this will have to be waiting a little bit. But Flying Toaster has got a lot of units. He does have well, these many units, a lot of QP. And I'm surprised he isn't Chrono Porting back those units to help support himself. This Farbot here, for example, could be very well used if it was Chrono Ported back a bit. Just to support itself. Well, Sun Strike is jumping around at 1357 mark now. Double checking this attack, and he does have this attack deflected pretty much. The one issue is this far up on this cloak far up on that Sunstrider does not see. And he will not be able to take care of it. He does not have a special ops to take care of it. He is at the 1421 mark, and he does have a special ops. I'm surprised, however, this special ops is not being teleported into that attack. Really, what he needs to do is teleport, well, needed to have done, although he could always chronoport it back and then teleport it, is to have teleported that special ops over into this attack. That would help him deal with it, but unfortunately, he's not able to do that, and he loses the north expansion. Flying Toaster jumping back to further once again to about the third, well, actually the 1427 mark, so about a minute after that far apart attack started. Sun Strider moving forward to attack, and rather Flying Toaster a minute down from him, keeping keeping himself fairly safe. Actually, it looks like he chrono ported quite a few units back. He did, in fact, what I can tell, do what exactly what I suggested he do, which was to chrono port back all of these units, and it looks like that is exactly what he's doing. These semi pods have been chrono ported back. Very slightly, but enough to help themselves out. So the Semipods will be supporting themselves very effectively. Actually, totally re Chronoport. Very nice. So, those Semipods have been very effective in just supporting themselves that little bit to keep themselves alive and keep their attack even more heavily damaging. Very neatly done. So, nice little Chronicle attack from Flying Toaster we see in the North Base. And jumping back just to review it, yes, we have the Chronoport and Semipods. They were only around with their doubles for. A few seconds, but that was all they needed to deal with that last mark. However, that still isn't really enough. These the far that survived and everything really should be sent back to help support this attack, like this one here. I'm really surprised that hasn't been sent back, and Flying Toaster just reviewing this battle. I wonder if he's... I'm thinking he's probably going to be trying to figure out where to target a Chronoport if he wants to send one, but he hasn't really sent any yet, and that's really annoying. I, that's annoying. I don't know why he hasn't sent any Chronoports back. Jumping towards the present, he does have... He does have a lot of resources. He doesn't have a lot of units, however, in the present, because he hasn't been building a lot throughout the timeline. Sunstrider, on the other hand, also not building a lot throughout the timeline, mostly focused on the past. Does have heavy cruisers up, though. Does have gay tech, of course. He doesn't have any Corona Porters still, but when he wants to, he can attack and... Okay, apparently, Flying Toaster accidentally Corona Porters some units towards the future. Regardless, the attacks coming in from Sunstrider, attack coming in very soon, will be... Damaging once it comes in. Sunstrider, sorry, Flying Toaster is chronoporting back some semi pods, which won't be able to deal with this. 
base at all, so it's going to be problematic. This other sleepy pod, another sleepy pod coming in from the future, but hanging out because it does not want to die. So from Sunshine's point of view, at the 1746 mark, that was about three minutes up from when we were looking. Nothing really exciting has gone on in the meantime, and Sunstrider is really just building up his forces. I'm once again surprised he has not built up more macro fabs and factories. He has the resources for it, he has the chrono energy for it, at least further, further to the present, which he's approaching rapidly. And it's just surprising he would easily have a twice as large army if he built some more macro fabs and factories. Regardless, Flying Toaster is also going back and producing more... And he's producing a little bit more, and has not really built a whole lot. So, he's apparently confused, not really doing very much. And setting up... Ah, eh, here we are. This is where he's using Chrono Energy. He's setting up all of his RPs to move, getting them out of where they were, and just fast forwarding towards the future at the 18 minute mark. And sending off another, another Plasma Cruise Missile. So once again, Plasma Cruise Missile coming in. We'll be dealing quite a bit of damage once it comes in. And Sunstrider will have to deal with that as it comes in. Looks like Sunstrider, on the other hand, is not going to be attacking anytime soon, which, like I said, is very strange. We don't see the Chronoport attack, or Chronoport coming in yet. And it looks like there was actually an attack coming in. Let me just double check. There's someone right about here. Yes, Chronoport rival. Ah, here we are. Here's the Plasma Cruise Missile. We'll be coming in and we'll be annihilating the entire ground army, that, or at least all the mechs that Sunstrider had. So Sunstrider's going to have to deal with that very quickly. And of course, that wasn't the only. Well, actually, that was the plasma cruise missile that just hit. The one that just shot off. It does. It chronoports back randomly. And there's the other plasma cruise missile that just came in that chronoported. That's fired right now. So, Sunstrider's gonna have to deal with this, and it's gonna be very hard to deal with. Like I said, he really needs to get more production structures. That's his biggest weakness at this point, is lack of production structures. And now Flying Toaster is building up Octos, has the chrono energy to do this. Getting more Octos, getting more units. However, really needs to have. Just lots more. Just. A great, great tactic to do is to jump just along the timeline, producing units, and then go back to when you were, and then deal with micro and anything you want to deal with. But Sunstrider now is trying to figure out what's going on in the timeline and what happened to all of his units, realizing that all of his units, or most of his units, his ground forces at least, have been destroyed, and one of his heavy cruisers as well. He needs to figure out how to get them out of the way, but he's not going to be able to get them out of the way in time. Of course, the attacks happen in the unplayable past here and here, so this is going to be a large problem. Sunstrider is going to have to deal with basically having a, about a quarter of his army that he had before once this red time wave hits. So now the red time wave is going to hit and his army has been... Oh, this isn't quite the decimation time wave. The decimation time wave must be the blue time wave then. However, we still see a lot of his ground forces, the weaker ones, the infantry and mechs were destroyed in that attack. And the red time wave does not have them anymore. So this is going to be very damaging. Sunstrider trying to figure out what's going on towards the future, while Flying Toaster sees that most of the forces of Sunstrider have been destroyed by the attacks by the Plasma Cruise Missiles. So Sunstrider is going to have a very hard time dealing with all of this. And it looks like Flying Toaster very oddly not building a lot of units. He's building a lot of RPs and getting his Octos set up. So he does have his bases set up, he is getting everything, his economy going once again. Here we are, now we have production. So Sepi Pods coming in, four Sepi Pods. Four more Sepi Pods coming in for Flying Toaster will be... Decently effective. The biggest threats now are the heavy cruiser stuff. So Seppi pods are the best bet. All the tanks died, and the Mar tanks aren't going to be as effective. However, the mechs are going to be a small problem that should be dealt with with Octopods or possibly Octoligos. He has had low legal class for most of the game. I'm surprised he hasn't built any legal class units. He definitely has the economy for it, at least one or two. And here we are. We have more Seppi pods coming in, and another group of Seppi pods. So eight Seppi pods will be coming in ultimately. Flying Toaster is going nuts with these heavy pods. Sunstrider, on the other hand, is building more units, not building a whole lot more mechs, but still not building a lot of production structures. This is, like I said, I'm I'm harping on this because it's really annoying me. And the production structures he does have are being used somewhat. His macro fab not being used as much, and he doesn't have. Oh, he does have. No, he doesn't have a corner quarter. So it must have been a warning for Flying Toaster because Sunstrider does not have a corner quarter on the field. And that is going to be a problem. Although Slingshot has been heavily damaged by this attack too. So Sunstrider, without a corner quarter, is double checking all parts of the timeline, figuring out exactly, making sure that he hasn't lost anything more than he thinks he has. And Sunstrider, and Sunstrider is going to have to deal with the Seppi pods. And like I said, Seppi pods great against air, not great against ground, and the mechs are going to be a problem. The mechs are going to be Sunstrider's biggest defense, which is why he's building a ton of them. It's good that he is. So once these Seppi Pods attack, once 
Flying Toaster actually goes ahead with this, then it will be a problem. But Sunstrider is trying to figure out what's going on, and surprised neither player is really attacking. I'm worried, actually, that neither player is really attacking, because this could be a replay issue rather than a... Yeah, you know, Sunstrider... Yeah, Sunstrider GG'd. I, yeah, I think the replay got messed up. So I apologize for that. Looks like Sunstrider did lose the game, and Flying Toaster... To Flying Toaster's shock... The shock and dismay, it, he's just suddenly GG'd. Okay, no, never mind. Something was... Some damage was had occurred. So here's a Sepipod attack. Anyway, here's a Sepipod attack. Apparently one that is a shadow of something that really happened in the main game. I'm not sure why this replay screwed up. I apologize for this. This I thought I was able to get around this or stop this from happening. Turns out there is still some replay corruption issues going on, so I apologize for that. And I will be attempting to... I will be restarting this game and then starting up another replay after this. Provided it hasn't been too late. I, yeah, I should be able to have one more regain going on. So, like I said before, Overgrown Citadel, rather long game. And... Now, actually, it looks like it might not be corrupt. It looks like... Sunstrider actually was trying to do actions that he couldn't do. And ended up just freezing. Hard to tell though. At any rate, Sunstrider. No, he must have it must be corrupt, because he did mention lack of Marines or Importers. So it looks like Sunstrider did lose at some point. I'm not sure exactly when, because we don't really see what happened. That was very strange. I apologize for that once again. But it happens sometimes. So we will have a short break while I just restart the game before the next replay because I've, I'm thinking that the replay corruption issue mostly happens, or at least will always happen, if the game doesn't happen. Sorry, if the game has been restarted. Basically, if I start the game and then restart the game, it works fine. Usually, or rather, if I watch a replay and then watch another replay, it screws up. If I don't, then it'll work fine. Anyway, there's another short game on Imperium. I think this is meant to be a really neat game, but it's a short game, apparently. So, we'll watch it. I believe it's between Shaka and Dolmont. But we'll double-check once we get in. Once the game starts. And Imperium, also another small map, like Overgrown Citadel. So, we have here... Oh, sorry about that. We have between two of... Oh, I apologize. I'm not actually showing the replay. I feel silly. Here we are. Now we're in the game again. I apologize for that. I'm... Yeah, this will be fine by the time of the tournament. So, here we have the game going on. Shalka and is playing Vecchio. Dolmont is playing CISO. Shalka is going for a... He's going partially for economy, getting two LCRPs, but not heavily for economy at this point. Three LCRPs. Dolmont, on the other hand, is going for a more economic build. Much more economic build. He's getting 7 RPs and... Well, 6 RPs in LC. He was trying to get a 7th, but he didn't have the money for it. So, 6 RPs, all of them in LC. No key PRPs. So, likely going for more of a low-tech attack build. Possibly infantry attack build for... Or at least quick production. I don't... He needs QP at some point in, in order to get anything, really. Shaka is going for economy build as well, and moving his Tethir and Shinvir towards Dolmont's base rather threateningly. Another another RP coming in, so both players going heavily for LC. They look like Grecum players around the time of the beta. Seriously, Grecum and the beta time built all LC because they're going for Octo Rush. And 2KP is coming up for Dolmont, so Dolmont will have a safe economy, provided he actually stays alive. And the Special Ops is coming in, knows that Shalka is Vecchio, but does not know what Shalka is doing in his base. So that Special Ops was only partially useful for scouting. Did see the Tethmir and Shinbir coming in, but Dolmont, which we're focusing on now, is not doing anything to deal with this. He can't really do anything to deal with this. The only thing he could do is set up an importer earlier, get half as many RPs, set up an early importer, then build some infantry to deal with them as they come in. But he's clearly not doing that right now. He's getting a factory instead. And the Tethmir and Shinbir are probably about 10 or 15 seconds away from Dolmont's base. Dolmont going to the north. He's building an expansion in the west middle expansion, and Shalka is further in the past. Shalka is going for a QP, getting some LC, 7 LC, and 2 QP. His Shinbir and Tethbir are moving into the base, 
and attack is on a time wave, so these units will be attacking directly. Shaka will be taking a bit of damage at first from the looks of the time wave, but then not taking much afterwards. More Zion Veers, and Zion Veers being pumped out of the annex, and another Zion Veer going to the top left expansion. Foundation being built. A Shinveer has built a foundation for Shaka, which will be able to heal up, and also if auto defense gets researched at some point, we'll be able to attack. So Dolmont now sees that these foundations are coming up, has to deal with this because foundations, foundation crawl is a dangerous strategy if you don't deal with it. It's very difficult to get through Vekir with foundations because foundations, like I said, heal up, detect, and can per turn to any building. Once auto defense is researched, they become cheap, but not super effective, but still in numbers, effective turrets. So foundations are a dangerous thing to fight against, and it doesn't look like Dolmont is doing anything to deal with this. He does have his special ops going up, he did echo out that scout, trying to keep it in place, but he isn't attacking the Shinbeer, he's attacking the Tethbeer instead. Tethbeer is gonna die, the Shinbeer is perfectly healthy. Well, not perfectly healthy anymore, 82 health, but still fairly healthy, and this foundation will be able to survive. Shaka is really not at all worried. The Tethbeer is gonna go down, but the Shinbeer, Shinbeer has not been blocked. The Marine looks like it was not really trying to get in the way, just happened to be there. Foundation is gonna heal the Shinbeer, so the Shinbeer will survive long enough to kill that Marine, and enough to start dealing some serious damage in the base. Dolmont has jumped back further. We're at the 229 mark. He's jumped back, trying to deal with this with... Still attacking the Teth Beer, not attacking the right unit. I mean, it's a bit hard to tell, unfortunately, the Vecchio design, but still, not attacking the right unit, unfortunately. This Teth Beer... Sorry for the Teth Beer, but the Shin Beer is not getting attacked. And now there's one chance. Oh no, Dolmont just lost that one chance he had that Shin Beer will... Oh, he could have killed that Shin Beer much earlier. The Shinbeer, however, should still be going down. There isn't enough healing. Yes, there, the Shinbeer will be going down. There's enough healing from the Special Ops, but Auto Defense has been researched. Shalka did get Auto Defense, like I expected he would, and it looks like Shalka will be able to hold this attack, provided that Dolmont does not take advantage of that one opportunity he got with the Special Ops and Marine, and Shalka has actually undone part of the attack, shifting it to a slightly later point in time. And the Special Ops and Marine not dealing with damage, but the Foundation is being built outside of Domont's base. Less powerful, but a lot harder to stop. A factory, the Domont's factory is also being built closer to this opening ramp. So both players building much further away from the main base of Domont. But Domont's still inside of his main plateau. Shalka, these Zionbeers are still going out to expand. Nothing's changed there. More Zionbeers going down to support. And a depot being built up. This is where it gets really powerful. Mid-ground depots allow for very fast vehicles because the vehicle build time is offloaded onto the infantry. The infantry are already built. Same with a lot of the LC cost. So the big cost is going to be QP. We see at 50 QP for Shalka right now. This is at Shalka's point of view, by the way. And Dolmont, from his point of view, has not actually changed all that much. Just setting up a factory, setting up his armories. His attacks in the north are not doing much. And he's getting really fast gate tech. What? Okay, I mean, I, I kind of see the rationale. Corona porting units back to s stop this attack before it happens, but like, you're opening up to a world of paradoxes there, and that's a lot of units you're not getting. Shaka, on the other hand, his point of view about, 30, about 20 seconds up is going to be attacking very effectively, destroying his infantry, destroying the HHC, and the HHC might as well not cloak because these foundations will see it no problem. So, this depot is definitely doing its job, Shalka's point of view, it's going to be able to do its job, and Dolmont, his gate tech has not been done yet, there's no mech set up, a mech will be set up, however, in the future, it's likely to die, it's moving towards the attack, and Dolmont is not dealing with this, a cloaked HTC, however, is actually helping to defend, it is far enough away from the foundations to help, the mech needs to move back, and it needs to start building that Corona Porter, here we are, the Corona Porter is being built, and this is where it's going to get really strange, because this Corona Porter is going to have to send back only causally consistent units to deal with this attack. The HSC really is the best bet, but I don't see the HSC lasting that long, even if it's Chrono Porter back. What needs to happen, of course, is to kill that Shin Beer before the foundations get built at all. Another HSC is coming up, and it's going to be another 30 seconds, no, well, another 10 seconds or so, relatively, before this Chrono Porter becomes useful, and the HSCs need to go back. This HSC is going back and will be Chrono Porting back. Two HSCs are going to start Chrono Porting back. And here we go, the Corona Port is occurring, Uppercut is happening for Dolmont, should be ending up somewhere around here. Not a great timing, the foundations have already been built at that point in time, but they are, yes, the depot has been built, but it will be able to deal with some of the units that have been set up as it is. So the agencies from the future will be able to kill 
Well, no, not actually. Not be able to kill anything, unfortunately. That that isn't going to be a particularly effective attack, I'm afraid. And no, actually, it is. Never mind. That Zion Pulsar is getting attacked. Sorry, the foundations have not been built yet, so the Zion Pulsars are being deflected with ease. Really, those HHCs actually working out fairly well. The foundations have been constructed now, so the foundations can see the HHCs. The HHCs will have to deal with that, and it will be a challenge. But one of the foundations is being destroyed. Another one becoming an, an ACC. Another Zion Pulsar coming in, and the HHCs are starting to help themselves out. However, one of them has died. One from the future has died. Another one from the future. Both future HHCs have died, and Dolmot is going to have to try to deal with this. It's much harder than he thought it was before, but the HHC is going to have to deal with an Annex. So Shalka is going to have a hard time dealing with all of this. Building an Annex instead of keeping it as a foundation means that HHC will have more power. So Shalka's attack has been partially defective, but he still has a contain going on on Dolmont. Dolmont's expansion in the northwest, still not doing too much. Shalka is expanding quite heavily to the northwest, so Shalka will be quite effective. Shalka at 517, or 519 mark, has Depot getting Zion Pulsar, two Zion Pulsars, getting Annex with Zion Veer as well. And Zion Pulsar is starting to attack. No, no foundations, but the ATHC is going to be damaged slightly by splash damage. Zion Pulsar has been destroyed. Zion Veer is going to be attacked afterwards, and that Zion Veer is going down. Trying to turn back into a Zion Pulsar, but not in time. Shaka does not have the time or chrono energy to... Yeah, nor the chrono energy, as we can see, to do that. So, not really much he can do. Another foundation being built up, and... Looks like Dolmont jumping back further, sending back even more units back to deal with this, and Shaka has actually managed to send some units towards the base? No, it looks like that attack... There was an attack that was... Perpetuated against Dolmont's base. I think we may actually have a paradox going on here, but I kind of doubt it. This seems like just a constantly unstable attack. The attack is actually happening quite heavily. We're seeing from Shalka's point of view, he is dealing a ton of damage for this attack, but that Chrono Porter was killed. That being said, the Chrono Porter was killed around here. The Chrono Ports happened around here. As we can see on Dolmont's timeline, the Chrono Ports happened here -ish. So, the Chrono Ports are causally consistent. This attack has been deflected. The Red Time Wave will be carrying that total deflection. And Dolmont actually kind of confused. No, he is able to Chrono Port no problem. So, no, it is a paradox. Yeah, Shaka actually did manage to make this into a paradox. Keeping his forces alive long enough to attack. And it looks like Shaka will actually get the paradox resolution in his favor. It's better to tell this paradox... This is the Chronoport right here, and I think the departure, ha the arrival happens somewhere in this general area, but it might have already fallen off the timeline, which means this departure might be going nowhere, might actually be causally inconsistent. This green time move will be the one to tell the truth about this, but I don't see it working out in Dolmont's favor. However, only the green time move will tell. This green time move is going to be sending, well, it's going to be depending on how far away we are from the Chronoport, and yes, the Chronoport has been cancelled, but the arrivals are... Are they gonna happen? And no, it looks like the arrivals did not happen. The HHCs were chronoported back into nothing and not chronoported at all. So the green time wave is going to show the blue time wave is correct. And Dolmont jumping back, ha sees that attack, has been heavily damaged. So the attack was... Was slightly unsuccessful. He did It looks like, yeah, Shalka did manage to get through and deal enough damage. Just actually get through the attack before the chronoports occurred outside of the Chronoport timeline and deal with that directly. So Shaka, very well done, delayed attack, and it looks like Shaka will win this game through a Paradox Resolution in his favor. However, that being said, it looks like the Chronoport are still survived slightly long enough. Yeah, not the first Chronoporter, but possibly the second Chronoporter. Regardless, Dolmont has lost this game. He does not have any other way of recovering. His only way of recovering is this Marine, but that has been destroyed by the Zion Veer to the northwest. So, very useful contained by Shalka. Like I said, Gate Tech, I'm really confused by the fact that Dolmont went for Gate Tech, and this is why. Dolmont did not have a lot of forces. The ATHCs, yes, they were powerful, but this foundation coming up would have allowed him to get through those ATHCs, no problem. So, while his attack is not as strong as it could have been in the first iteration, it's still strong enough to deal with everything, meaning that Shalka has won this game quite handily. Well done. So, Shalka won the game against Dolmont, and that's going to be the only cast for tonight. I kind of have to go to bed. It's kind of late right now. So, I hope you enjoyed that. I apologize about the first cast not working out as well as it could have, and admittedly this cast I did kind of miss when Shaka changed around his attack 
to deal with the Chrono Porter, but I'm guessing that this foundation would have allowed the ATHDs to be detected, which would allow the Zion Pulsar to kill the ATHDs from the future, stopping them from dealing a whole lot of damage and allowing them to go through, killing the Chrono Porters. Ultimately, a delayed attack would have also caused this. Regardless, a paradox did occur, resolving in Shalka's favor, winning him the game. So, kind of by chance. Yes, it does. And Sakhanov in the chat chat channel is pointing out that the Chrono Rush got actually Paradox over the course of several time waves, which kind of makes sense. The Chrono Porter was actually being used, it looks like it was being used over and over again. So, yeah. Doma, we noticed actually at some points, was trying to skip over some of the Chrono Porter propagations to keep it alive further. Unfortunately, he didn't skip back and try to keep the arrival on the timeline, which would have been the best thing to do. So, I hope you enjoyed that, and have a good night, everyone.